Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and Congresswoman Davis. No military family should go hungry, but we're here today because too many are. I'm Ashi Shabazirani, Executive Director and CEO of the National Military Family Association. NMFA has been working with Mizone, a Jewish response to hunger for years, committed to ending food insecurity in military families. Today, we are joined by over 100 local, state, and national organizations ready to end military hunger. For many Americans, the very idea that military families might go hungry seems absurd. However, the evidence documenting military family food insecurity is irrefutable, and it's not a new issue. Military families were already going hungry before the pandemic. During the 2018-2019 school year, one-third of military children at DOD-run schools in the United States were eligible for a free or reduced-price lunch. At Fort Stewart in Georgia, 65% were eligible. While one in 10 Americans are currently experiencing food insecurity, one in eight military families are food insecure. Yet they still volunteer to serve our nation, even when it means going hungry. Families told us they were stockpiling discount canned ravioli. So when the paycheck ran out, they still had something in the back of the cabinet. Other families got by on bread with peanut butter and powdered milk and nothing else. At home in the United States, these families are struggling, but they don't need to be. The basic needs allowance would help these military families get by with a modest supplement to their base pay. We urge leaders of the House and Senate Armed Services Committees to do, the right, to do right by military families and establish the Military Basic Family Needs Allowance in the fiscal year 2021 National Defense Authorization Act. It might be the difference between putting food on the table and going hungry for some families, between knowing your family's okay and wishing you had cans of ravioli stashed in a cabinet. That kind of help would have been critical for Bianca Strakowski's military family. Bianca is a military spouse, NMFA scholarship winner, highly respected media professional, mentor, leader, and success story. Bianca is also a military spouse who has gone hungry and has struggled to put food on the table. Her family could have used the basic needs allowance. Instead, they went hungry. She has joined us today to share her story. Please welcome Bianca. Good afternoon. My name is Bianca Strakowski, and I am the wife of a recently retired Marine. My husband, Ronald Strakowski, retired in 2018 after 20 years of service in the Marine Corps as an enlisted Marine. Our relationship spanned well before he stepped on the yellow footprints of Paris Island in high school. Our marriage started just two months shy of the post night of the 9-11 attacks. So my entire experience with the military has been the op tempo that occurred after that day. Our first duty station was at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. I was able to work from a minimum wage position up to management. But soon after we started our established life there, we received orders to Marine Corps Air Station, Yuma, Arizona. We had built our life on budget of two incomes. When we moved, like most military spouses, I was unable to find work that was comparable to the childcare costs that we would require. We quickly spiraled into a very sad and what I consider shameful time as he was a sergeant in the Marine Corps. We had to rely on food bank food. What that entailed was going, spending $10 to get a box of food, that was recently expired from the grocery store. We relied on WIC. And when I was pregnant with my second son, we relied on MREs that are distributed to soldiers in the field to feed our family dinner. All while this was happening, I was very aware of the different programs and resources that exist. But there is a very real stigma and fear to our service members' careers to report these things that are happening in our household. My husband is a proud Marine. 
He has won accolades and awards and promotions throughout his entire career. But while he would have to deploy to places like Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Horn of Africa repeatedly, we were unsure truly how we were going to make ends meet, pay our bills, and feed our family on a continuous basis. We then moved to our next duty station in North Carolina. We could not get out of this cycle of financial hardship. We leaned on payday advance loan, loans that sometimes had interest rates of 40%. I was very involved in the military community. By 2011, I had been named the military spouse of the year. I represented 1.1 mil, million military spouses and could not consistently figure out how we were gonna pay for groceries in our family. Anytime you hear people speak up on the military leadership side about issues of mental health, financial hardship, marital issues, the external message is that you should seek help. But there is an unspoken code in the military to not talk out loud, which is why I am not sharing this story until he has now retired. He had fear of seeking help for our family. We just could not cut it with an enlisted paycheck to feed our family of five. It was not until he left the Marine Corps that at 40 years old, we finally established a savings and we are no longer in that situation. I do not believe that my story is a rare one. In fact, in my profession of hearing stories and telling stories, I know it is a common experience not just in the junior ranks, but all the way up to E7 where we existed in our last few years in the Marine Corps. Not only is financial literacy an important part of this and the spouse employment, but when you build a life at a duty station like we are taught to dive in, to work according to that local economy, and then you move to another place that might have a different economy, you are no longer in the same financial situation. That affects the morale of the service member, of the family. We did consider wanting to leave the Marine Corps, but I had found out I was pregnant with our third son, Christopher, and it just did not fe seem feasible to start over from scratch. So we were stuck in this cycle. Military families are prideful people. They volunteer on a higher basis than our civilian counterparts. We dig in deep into our local communities, even though we start off as strangers there. But behind closed doors, we are having really tough conversations. There is nothing more stressful than having your husband fighting in combat in Afghanistan and having to lean on your extended family members or payday loans to feed your children. There is truly nothing sadder than that reality for our families. I think it would be important for us to put this issue at the forefront, no longer make it a shameful topic to come forward about. And I guarantee you, if we create that platform for families to step forward without fear of impact to their career, you would find out that this is a very common issue afflicting military families today. Bianca, thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, my name is Josh Protus. I'm the Vice President of Public Policy at Mazon, a Jewish response to hunger. And as we'll discuss more, unfortunately, stories like Bianca's are all too common. And Bianca, thank you for your husband's service and your family's service to our country. It's a shameful situation that you experienced, not because you should have felt shame, but shameful that there are families like yours that have to endure this painful reality of food insecurity when there are solutions to address it. I'm now pleased to welcome Congresswoman Susan Davis, who has been a long-standing champion of addressing this issue. It's an issue that uh, is very personal for her because in her in the district that she represents, that includes Camp Pendleton, there are four food pantries that serve the Camp Pendleton community. And let's just think about that, four food pantries serving just one base. Uh, it's an outrageous situation and we are so appreciative of the leadership that you've shown in your partnership in addressing this issue. Congresswoman, please. Thank you so much. And good morning, everyone. Good afternoon as well. 
Uh, I want to thank you for the introduction, Josh, and for all of you being here. And thank you, Bianca, for sharing your story. As we have seen over the years, food insecurity is a problem that far too often lives in the shadows, and we appreciate your being there to discuss it. Military families have already given so much. They certainly should not miss meals. You know, it has also been hard to determine the extent of this problem. Because despite pushing for years to get data, the Department of Defense has not shared what we need, which suggests they see no problem at all. But we have seen it right in front of us today. We see military families lining up in food banks on bases across the country. This is something we have the power to change. We have already enacted many programs during COVID that have helped prevent Americans from going hungry. And I sincerely hope that we will look at these examples, particularly the Universal School Lunch Program that clearly enables families to feed their children during this disruption and the hardship that we have seen in people's lives. This is all about kids and military kids should not have barriers to access food and that's what the basic needs allowance would fix. We are also looking at language to try to make changes to school lunch programs for military families because students, as we all know, do better when they are well fed. While the basic needs allowance is included in the House version of the National Defense Authorization Act, it is at risk if we don't get the support of senators on the committee. This is so important to these families and we have to get it right. I want the military and the Senate to work with us to make sure everyone serving our country is taken care of. If they don't think the basic needs allowance is the right approach, then let's get the data and let's figure out which one is. We can't let military families suffer. We can't let them do that. So I wanna thank Mazone and NFMFA, NMFA for all of their hard work over the years. And now it's my pleasure to turn it back over to our next presenter. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Davis. Um, we appreciate your work um, on this issue, military hunger issue, as well as other support that you've provided for service members and military families over the years. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Congressman Don, um, Don Young of Alaska, who's gonna share a few words. Um, Representative Young has co-sponsored the Military Hunger Prevention Act along with Congresswoman Davis. We have people, hello, I'm Congressman Don Young and I'm proud to talk about solving some of our military families' food insecurity. This is a novel, I call situation that should never happen. We have people serving the military and their families are not being fed. So I teamed up with Congressman Susan Davis and worked with them to introduce the bill Military Hunger Prevention Act. If it gets passed, which it will, because we'll have a lot of support, we will be able to take care of those people that serve our country with pride and our true patriots. So our job is to make sure that we have food on their tables so they can do their duty and their mission. And I'm proud to be part of that. As an ex-military person, I was never hungry because I was by myself. But these people were the family, these members are the family, they need the food on the table so they have the strength to do it. So I'm happy about the bill. I hope it'll work out well. And I know the people of America will rise to the occasion and feed our military people as they should be. Many thanks to Congressman Young for uh, those words and for your support and leadership on this issue. And it's important to note that there has been bipartisan support for addressing this issue, both in the House and the Senate. As Congresswoman Davis mentioned, uh, the provision, the Military Family Basic Needs Allowance was included in the FY21 NDAA bill that passed the House. It was uh, part of the subcommittee mark with unanimous support and bi strong bipartisan support in the House bill. Um, 
I'm pleased to be able to give some historical framing about this issue and talk about the policy that we're proposing that would address the, the shameful issue of food insecurity among military families. As Congresswoman Davis mentioned and others have mentioned, this has been a long overlooked issue and it's an issue that touches on critical issues of mission readiness, as well as retention and recruitment. Obviously, when a service member is worried about his or her family being able to have food to eat at night, they can't be fully focused on their mission at hand, especially when they're deployed. And for service members who struggle to make ends meet, they might look elsewhere outside of the military for career options, and we risk losing good talent in our armed forces. We also know that for children who grow up in households uh, that struggle with food insecurity, they're at greater risk of diet-related health conditions, including diabetes and obesity, that put them at risk of not being able to serve later in life. And we know that children in military families are much more likely to go into the armed forces themselves. So we risk our future generation of, uh, of our military and having enough people to be able to serve. As was mentioned, there are food pantries on or near almost every military base in the country. It's an unacceptable and shameful situation that's been allowed to persist because the Department of Defense continues to pretend that there isn't a problem and Congress has failed to take action to address this really easily solvable problem. There've been numerous past efforts at addressing this issue. Mazon has worked at this for nearly 10 years. Um, including dealing with the Family Subsistence Supplemental Allowance. So some past history about this issue. Congress took action uh, in the late 1990s in response to press stories about military families that received help from the food stamp program. And the Department of Defense did not like the optics of that program, of, of that situation, and so established the FSSA program as a way to deal with the PR problem and the optics of military families receiving food stamps. Unfortunately, there were two main problems with that FSSA program. One, it still treated the basic allowance for housing as income and prevented people who needed help from qualifying. And more importantly, in order to apply for that program, a service member would have to go through their base chain of command. And that raised lots of questions about shame and stigma and about career status for those service members. And as a result, very few people actually enrolled in the program. Mazone engaged with the uh, Military uh, Compensation and Retirement Modernization Commission with recommendations about how the FSSA program could easily have been reformed to better address the underlying issue of food insecurity by excluding the basic allowance for housing as counted income and by taking the application and eligibility process outside of the base chain of command. Unfortunately, Congress decided to sunset the FSSA program domestically in 2016 without taking any further action. So service members who were struggling and had trouble qualifying in the first place were left with no other recourse and, and no other assistance to help them. We've tried addressing this issue in the Farm Bill process where the SNAP program is authorized about every five years. And unfortunately, ran into difficulties about trying to find offsets uh, in order to expand access for SNAP and could not get the, the buy-in and the leadership to, um, to support a provision to allow and expand food stamp access for military families. As a result, we've worked closely with National Military Family Association about uh, a creative new approach to address this issue in the NDAA process. And we've crafted the Military Family Basic Needs Allowance. Working closely with Congresswoman Susan Davis and, and Congressman Don Young, this is a way that would build on the FSSA program in a more functional uh, format. So it would exclude the basic allowance for housing as counted income when determining the eligibility. And it would take the application and notification process outside of the base chain of command. It would uh, call on the Defense Finance and Accounting Service at DOD, DFAS, to automatically notify every service member who's potentially eligible, whose base pay is at or below 130% of the federal poverty guidelines. 130% of the federal poverty guidelines is the base minimum um, access for SNAP based on, on gross income levels. There's actually flexibilities that states can utilize that can take that up to 200% of the federal poverty line. This was a compromise uh, approach that would be targeted to those in need. 
So a service member would be notified that they're potentially eligible. It would be incumbent upon them to report if their spousal income or other household income that would change their eligibility status. A service member would have the option to opt out if they didn't want to receive this added benefit, if it might uh, jeopardize their, uh, their receipt of another federal assistance program, they would have the option to, uh, to choose to opt out. At the same time, DFAS would provide financial management information and resources to those service members. Um, we know that that's not the primary issue that's driving uh, this, but it's part of the pushback that we often hear. And so as a, a nod to that, We'd call on DFAS to provide financial management resources to help those service members. But more importantly, they would get that targeted assistance, an additional cash benefit that would put them just above 130% of the federal poverty guidelines to help them meet their basic needs. The Pentagon says that when you compare the pay and benefits to counterparts in the private sector, it's more than fair. But the fact that we have food pantries that are serving military families across the country says otherwise. It's important to recognize that a substantial percentage of civilian households who receive assistance from SNAP include households with someone who works. SNAP is a critical support for millions of working poor families. Unfortunately, there are far too many working poor families who struggle to get by on low wages. And that includes thousands of junior enlisted military families who rightly should be considered among the working poor. Only these military families are prevented from qualifying and getting the assistance they need from SNAP because their BAH is treated as income. As an example of a family that would be helped by the Military Family Basic Needs Allowance, uh, we, can, we can look at an E2 household with less than two years of service with a household of four. So that would count three dependents. With a base pay of $1,942.50 per month or just over $23,000 annually. At 130% of federal poverty guidelines for a household of four, that would come to $34,000, just over $34,000. The difference between 130% of the federal poverty guidelines and the annual base pay that that E2 would receive is a little over $10,000. It's $10,750. So that household would qualify for a monthly benefit just under $900. CBO had estimated that the average assistance that would be provided to, uh, to junior enlisted families was about $400 per month. And in the bigger picture, that's not much. When you look at the Pentagon budget and you look at, at the uh, budget for salaries, but that $400 a month makes a tremendous difference for a household that's struggling to put food on the table and struggling to meet, meet their basic needs. The Military Family Basic Needs Allowance is a common sense targeted approach to resolving this issue. And, and we know that it can make a huge difference for these families. This provision is targeted and it's temporary assistance. It's reaching those households at a time of their greatest need. And as service members promote up, they move outside of eligibility as their pay increase and they, they would quickly um, no longer qualify. Among other timely considerations um, and benefits of this program, the Military Family Basic Needs Allowance would contribute in the effort to prevent military and military spouse suicides. With military suicide rates at an all-time high and recent studies showing an, a significant uptick during the pandemic, we should be doing all that we can to address this tragic concern. And given the correlation that's been documented between food insecurity and suicidal ideation, it's simply irresponsible to continue to ignore military families who struggle and not provide them the assistance they need, especially when that can head off a downward uh, mental health that can lead, unfortunately, to suicide. In addition, the greater societal recognition of racial injustice and inequities and concern about the disproportionate challenges that service members of color face, particularly represented in the junior enlisted ranks, provides another reason as a matter of mission readiness, retention, and recruitment. Um, we urge the Hill offices that are joining us today to reach out to the House and Senate Armed Service Committee and urge them to prioritize addressing this issue. To hear a little bit more about why this is 
support and, and the challenges military families face. I'm pleased to turn things over to my outstanding colleague, Jennifer Davis at NNFA. Thank you so much, Josh. As Josh mentioned, I'm Jen Davis. I'm a military spouse, a veteran, and I'm the Government Relations Deputy Director for Financial Readiness at the National Military Family Association, or NMFA. That means I work really closely with military families who are struggling to make ends meet, struggling to put food on the table. Today, we've heard about various factors that can affect a military family's ability to put food on the table. The truth is there are multiple elements that play a part in military hunger, and some of these have been made worsened by the pandemic, as Josh just mentioned. For example, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, military self-unemployment had maintained a staggeringly high rate of 24% for many years. And now, due to the pandemic, that number has grown, much like it has across the nation. Some estimate the current unemployment rate among military spouses to be 30% or higher. Military spouses or many military spouses who are fortunate to secure employment while moving frequently are oftentimes underemployed. This means that they've started at the bottom of the corporate ladder with each move, or they're working in a field not related to their degree or training. Frequent moves also contribute to other issues affecting a family's ability to provide basic needs, such as reestablishing and maintaining affordable quality childcare, replacing furniture or other belongings due to relocation mishaps, or living in poor conditions like we've seen those associated with many privatized houses. Additionally, due to recent legislative and policy shifts, there are more demands on the service member's basic pay. For instance, basic allowance for housing has been diminished over the past few years to cover only 95% of housing costs. This is sure to increase the housing burden for junior enlisted service members with larger families. The restructured retirement system also increases demands on service members' pay, and even minimal contributions to ensure future retirement are many times used to provide basic needs facing the family today, because every penny counts. I know this to be true, not only because it's my job as an advocate, but also because I've experienced the hard decisions that a young junior enlisted family must make to make ends meet. We hear from so many families forced to make impossible decisions. They're paying for childcare with credit cards they can't pay off. They're working out payment plans for utilities just to put gas in the tank to get to work. And for military families who show up every day to serve our nation, they do this through service, through sacrifice, and through the stigma, shame, and judgment that comes when they speak out. When NMFA hears stories like this, we know we have to do more than just listen. That's why we're here today. It's why we've partnered with Mazone, why we've asked Bianca to share her story despite the shame and stigma associated with hunger. Our nation is asking impossible things of its military. We're just asking that Congress does what it must to ensure they don't go hungry. Congress can stop the stigma, shame, and hunger. The military family basic needs allowance must be included in the fiscal year National Defense Authorization Act. And now to lead the discussion around your questions, I am pleased to introduce the president and CEO of Mazone, a Jewish response to hunger, Abby Liebman. Thank you, Jen. Um, I'm very pleased to be here, and, and I'm going to try to wrangle you all through a, a Q&A that um, I'm going to try to direct questions to specific speakers, but I may, if you want to signal me in some way, just raise your hand um, and let me know that you also have something you'd like to say. I don't want to leave anybody out. In, if we were doing this in real life, I'd be able to see you, but just, just bear with me. We're going to try to do this through the virtual land that we're all now in. Um, and actually, the first question, I'd like to start with you, Congresswoman Davis, and um, then add Aish and Josh, both of you also comment on this. Um, oh, I'm not going to start with Jeff Davis because I'm going to start with, oh, hello, you're there. Good. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I'm getting 
Okay, I'm getting lots of messages. Welcome to the reality of Zoom. Um, so my first question is sort of a bigger bridging kind of question. You know, Congresswoman, you know this well. Um, the NMFA um, colleagues here know this well. We have been working on this issue for almost 10 years at Mazon. And we've tried a number of different approaches. And here we are in this moment in 2020 in the midst of a horrendous pandemic at a moment when food insecurity rates are mind-numbingly huge in the United States. And what causes there for optimism that this time, this solution, that is the military family basic needs allowance, is actually going to see some kind of success? Even if there's some compromise, maybe you could speak to that if you could see points where there would have to be compromise. Why is there cause for hope in this moment? Yeah, Abby, it's a great question because we all are looking for, for reasons to, to have hope right now. And I think that my constituents, I know, remind me all the time that um, they, they really want to see problems solved. And this is a good environment for that because people in some ways are, are more willing to try new things. The one thing that gives me some hope, actually, and I mentioned it in my remarks because we are feeding all of our children who go to public schools through a program that really no longer um, uh, says, you know, you, you fill out these forms and you qualify versus you don't qualify. And, and it's because it was such a difficult task to be able to do that. We were able to get our colleagues and all of us to agree on our side um, that that's important and that we would cover that through the end of the year. I'm hopeful that we're gonna look at that and we're gonna see whether the, the no longer a need to have so much administrative <laughs> backup um, for these programs would give us the ability to make sure that every child receives the, the food that they need. And it means that family, it's a lot like the summer school program. So families are coming to school to pick up the, the meals, to pick up the sandwiches, to pick up the meals um, for the students. And it really has worked very, very well. And it, so we need to take a look at that. And that's not to say that we, you know, uh, adopted exactly the way it is when we're out of this, this situation. But the reality is we may well be in this situation for quite a bit longer. And even if schools go have a transition from hybrid, you know, onto full school um, seating, then uh, that, that may change things a little bit. But I think it gives us a way of, of having a, a, it's not necessarily a roadmap, but it is an opportunity to say, what made a difference? How did that work? What would we do differently? If we were even starting over, what would we do differently? And that's, that's, that's good. And obviously that affects our military families as well. Now it's not the only answer for our military families, uh, but because we know that so many of them are in school, then it's in, in, in all of our public schools throughout the, throughout the country, that it gives us uh -huh. uh, some way of, of taking a look at that and maybe learning from them too. I love the fact that Bianca was saying that her voice and the ability to speak now um, is, is because she's, she's out of the service. You know, that tells, I think, all of our people who work with military personnel that they can't in any way, shape or form, uh, suggest to families that they should not be listened to. We must listen to them. And the fact that we're encouraging more families uh, to do that is, is important. But I know that Bianca's feeling is real, very, very real, because I experienced that with military families um, over the years. And just when they really are needing help is when they, they often feel that it's not appropriate, you know, that, that, their, um, that their family could be hurt uh, as a result of their their voice being heard. Thank you. So, Aish, I'm going to ask you the same question, building on what um, Congresswoman Davis has just shared with us. Do you see some cause for optimism, some, some movement, some moment that we're in that is unique in its challenges, which is a lovely euphemism for this time, 
um, but also perhaps presenting some possibilities. Uh, so thank you. I, I I do see some cause for hope. I, I think just just even the fact that we're having a dialogue like this today, right? That there are over 40 participants, right, from from people outside of our organizations who are interested in this topic. Uh, the fact that um, the basic needs allowance made it through the House, and and that you know now we're, we're looking for support now on the Senate side. Those are those are causes for optimism. I think the other the other cause for optimism, and I'll just build on what Congressman Davis said, and, and really Bianca's story, is that I think there's a greater understanding that this is a multifaceted problem. This is not just a financial problem alone. There is a challenge mm -hmm. associated with culture, and that we're now at least talking about the fact that this is a cultural issue, it is a well-being issue, it's a mental health issue, um, and that we're talking about the connection, particularly around children, right, and children succeeding, and that gut-brain connection, right? If we're not thinking about these military children, who frankly are the future of our force, 80% of those who serve today are military connected. So if we're not taking care of these children, we're not taking care of the future force. So those are all, I think, causes for optimism that we're approaching this with a comprehensive solution. I think the basic needs allowance addresses it in a comprehensive, uh, comprehensive way. Thank you, Ash. Josh, I'm gonna tweak the question slightly for you. Um, because amid what I'm hearing here is a strong basis for some optimism. Can you articulate what some of the opposition is that we've heard over the years that we fear could surface even in this particular context? Sure. Um, unfortunately, we've heard a lot of the same kind of pushback over the years. And, and I think much of this is grounded in stereotypes and a misunderstanding of the issue. So we've heard variations of the same story about a service member, a young single male, usually, who drives up to the food pantry in a new vehicle that he purchased. Um, he's gone and blown his, his paycheck on. Um, that's not who we're talking about uh, when we're talking about this issue. It's not a single individual. Um, we're talking about families. We're talking about junior enlisted families, uh, E1s to E4s for the most part, although there are some um, it, it, who up to E7s that Bianca mentioned um, who have larger households, who have households of five and above who have difficulty making ends meet. And we know that the base pay just is not enough to support an entire household. So I think just hearing stories like Bianca's helps to counter that, um, that stereotype and, and get people to understand the reality um, that these families are facing and, and also understand that this is in our country. As Ash mentioned, you know, for future recruitment, for the children in the military households, we want to make sure that they're able to reach their full potential. And if they choose to serve in the armed forces, that they're fit to be able to do so and that they've grown up healthy and not struggling with, with food insecurity. I think there's reason for optimism because this provision received overwhelming bipartisan support in the House and is within the grasp of the Senate to take action. And really looking at a few key leaders of the Senate Armed Service Committee who, um, who will play a pivotal role in the negotiations. We've seen press accounts um, in the past year about a new food pantry that's opened up in North Carolina in the midst of the pandemic of military families. And, and Senator Tillis, who chairs the, the, the military personnel subcommittee, has the ability to make sure that this provision gets included in the final NDAA bill. Chairman Inhofe from Oklahoma mm -hmm. has the ability to make sure that this gets included in the final NDAA bill. Ranking member Reed has the ability to, to make sure that this gets included. So I'm cautiously optimistic that um, the reality of the situation will, uh, will sorry, a little feedback, will um, get through to people and, um, and the Senate will, will follow up and take action. I'll also note that, that one of the challenges has been about a lack of data um, to address this issue, and, and we'll probably talk more about this, mm -hmm. but in, because there hasn't been 
a lot of official data gathered by DOD. DOD has really been reluctant in gathering this data and has been asking the wrong questions. For example, in its quadrennial review of military compensation, they're just looking at how many military families actually participate in SNAP, but they're not asking how many struggle and can't get the help that they need. But groups like Blue Star Families and the Military Family Advisory Network are doing surveys and are asking questions to get a better handle on this issue. And I think that um, that additional data and the stories that we're gathering are reason for optimism too, that more people are recognizing the problem that really exists. Thank you, Josh. Bianca, I wanna... Oh, that was weird. Okay. Uh, I love Zoom, except when it doesn't work. Um, I, uh, I want to pivot to you for a moment, Bianca, because I think that um, you, among others, did articulate this notion of stigma and the idea of, uh, of I, I think it's really important for everyone to understand how courageous it was for you to speak. Um, that I think that many of the speakers have acknowledged that, and I think it's important for everyone listening to realize what this means. Um, that it is um, to confess to a need that it, your the infrastructure, the support systems, the superiors, the hierarchy refuses to even acknowledge exists. And to have to say, I'm having it in a moment where people will not acknowledge it, I think takes a tremendous amount of courage. And it must also be powerful you, for you to hear some of what Josh just articulated, which is what you would have heard um, that it's, it's your problem. This is your fault. In other words, you don't know how to manage your money. You've overspent on something frivolous. Or it is that you've, you should go elsewhere. So I also want to ask if you went elsewhere for help. And if so, what the outcome of that was. And what would for you have been such a, a, a boon if, if it would be, of what this basic needs allowance would have done that those other programs could not. I think it's important to remember who is the person that raises their hand to serve our country, right? These are alpha personalities mm -hmm. who are putting on a uniform to stand up for the greatest nation on earth. And our, our military families sign on to that also. So at any cost, we're willing to absorb the components of this lifestyle. But the reality is the components of this lifestyle snowball to lead to these issues like food insecurity. We have to move. You're going to move multiple times in your military career. So a spouse is going to leave a job. You are going to move with the expenses you had at one duty station and take them to the next. Your family's going to grow. Service members are entitled to have husbands and wives and children. Um, mm -hmm. We leaned on possibly every type of program you could imagine and still could not get out of that hole. And I am not saying that there wasn't a component of it where we were a very young couple when we started this military life. Um, so managing finances, understanding you're gonna move, you have to have a budget that can fit the new zip code, wherever that might be that the Marine Corps wants you. But the core element, we were not living a lavish lifestyle. We had three boys, we were living very modestly, we want the American dream like our peers do in the civilian world. Um, and, and going back to what was our choices, we did use, use a food bank. And that food bank gave, and it was a great help because it, it supplemented food, but the food bank food was expired goods from a grocery store. We did lean on WIC, but like it was mentioned here, there were moments where we did not qualify because BAH was considered part of my husband's income in certain locations. Um, we leaned on the Navy Marine Corps Relief Society, who one year was our only source of Christmas presents for our children. Um, and we had those tough decisions. While he's deployed, can we keep doing this? But it is ingrained in him and through osmosis ingrained in me that we were going to just suck it up. And that's what we're trained to do as military families. And I think that's probably why there's been some resistance to expand um, assistance like this, because I think mm -hmm. the government also almost views us as that demographic will just suck it up. 
And I don't think it needs to be that way. Why not give military families the tools to succeed so they can continue doing that job, whatever you're asking of them today and whatever you're probably gonna be asking of them tomorrow. Thank you. Josh, I think you had something you wanted to add um, to that very articulate answer. Um, I, I just wanna... <laughs> okay, Josh is muted. Now he's gonna work that out. So instead, I'm gonna to pivot to Jen because I have a question for Jen that um, I'll get back to you, Josh. Um, Josh has, can have confidence, I, you know, we work together, he knows, I'm, I'll be reliable. Um, we had a question from one of our participants um, about the relationship between the circumstances if the service member is deployed overseas and the family is deployed with him or her, and also if the service member is deployed overseas and the family is left here. Who can tap into what of the resources that Bianca has just articulated and what's the impact for either the member or the family if they cannot? You're muted. Okay, Josh, are you taking that? No, Jen, you're gonna take it. Can you do that or no? I'll give it to Josh if you want me to. I think Josh, with okay, Josh, Josh doesn't on. want to either. No one wants this question because it's a hard question. Um, Josh, now you look like you're going to talk, but you're muted. Oh, I can, I, I can try. I mean, for those who are posted overseas, the family subsistence supplemental allowance is still available. Um, there are very few people who actually participate in that program. And part of that um, it's because not many people are aware of it, uh, but again, there's that, that barrier about going through your base chain of command. Uh, by statute, uh, service members who are posted overseas are not eligible to receive SNAP benefits, um, so that is a challenge there. And, and I think that you know, the greatest issue that we've seen are, are really for those who are, are posted domestically, um, and, and, and that's an issue. And I just wanted to... The, Sorry about the technical difficulties before, but uh, say a couple things about um, the issues of personal financial management, that, that sort of allegation. Congressman Young um, had a great quote, and I just wanted to read this, in response to the administration's opposition to the military family basic needs allowance that really speaks to this. He said, DOD's response to this problem has been, to put it politely, lacking. Their description of this problem is minimal, and their suggestion that these members take financial literacy training is not only insulting and condescending, but also does nothing to help the problem. If anything, their response helps to exacerbate this problem by keeping the barriers of shame and stigma to assistance intact. Um, and, and also just want to note that there's some rich hypocrisy in the Department of Defense making recommendations about financial responsibility, because the last time I saw news about a financial audit for DOD, it didn't come out so well. <laughs> okay, take that. Um, okay, Jen, now I'm gonna pivot to you with a question that is actually about DOD. So that's a nice segue, thank you, Josh. Um, we have a we have a question that came in about whether or not um, the DoD and the Pentagon budget provide any kind of funding for families um, that may be struggling. For this population was the terminology used, and I'm thinking that's what it must be um, a reference to. So this may um, include some of the conversation about what other kinds of support is available to families that are struggling. So thank you for that question, Abby. Um, yeah, so it's a good question. Um, I, I didn't know if they were talking about pay raises. I do want to address um, annual pay raises because that comes up a lot um, in, as Josh and I meet with different individuals. Um, and I think that it's important to note that um, there have been pay raises. Um, we, we've seen them this year. We'll be seeing them next year. Um, for military personnel, much like there is in the public and private sector. Um, those pay raises are tied to increases to private sector wages, which are measured by the Employment Cost Index. Um, so 
those are not just random numbers, although Congress and the President has the authority to increase the pay raise amount above the ECI rate if they desire. Um, the President also has the authority to set the pay raise to be lower than the ECI established rate, um, which has happened over time. And so it's important to note that there's, there's a process for that. Um, it's not just arbitrary numbers. And that over the past few years, um, not recent years, but going back a little bit, there were some times where the president did set that pay raise below the ECI rate. And um, so currently the military is set back 2.6%. Um, because those pay raises didn't keep up with the ECI rate. You are mute. And as Josh mentioned, part of the question was, um, you know, if there's other assistance for this. As he mentioned, the FSSA is still on the books for those who are stationed overseas and can't um, qualify for SNAP because they're in a OCONUS location. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm mindful of the time, so I think we're going to wrap it up with, with one last question, um, which um, I'm going to start again with you, Congresswoman, is, you know, I'm, I'm not naive about how legislation moves and how it changes, and certainly one of, one of the moments when we were looking at, a, at doing something different in the NDA, and there was a proposal made by one of your colleagues that would have essentially gutted what we were asking for, um, but uh, might have moved this forward, and then um, even that didn't proceed. Are there places where you see you would be willing to compromise on what we are asking in um, the military family basic needs allowance? Is there something about it that you would say there's room for discussion and compromise here so that if the bill won't move forward, unless there's this change you'd be willing to accept? Well, it, it, as with everything else, you know, it, we all want to try and solve problems. And, and sometimes mm -hmm. playing with the numbers uh, can, can bring people together. Uh, but the reality is that what do our families need? I mean, they need to be able to have a good income that supports them, often supports uh, only one um, member contributing to, to the family budget because it's impossible, as Bianca said, for many women, even professional PhDs, I mean, people who have, um, you know, high ranking occupations that would be paid well if they were in a different situation. So I, I just think that, you know, families, they need to have a, a fair income to be able to support their families. And if we start playing around and saying, well, you know, they don't need this or that, we also have to remember, and here I am in California, in San Diego, and we know that the cost, not just the cost of housing, but even finding uh, a place to, to rent is, is difficult um, on, on a budget. And so I think we have to really be aware of that and make sure that we're not asking people because they're going to vote with their feet. You know, if, if we cannot have the force we need to protect our country and, and support our country, uh, then uh, that means that people have made a decision that they're not going to serve because they can't afford to live and eat and do all the things that they, you know, that they need to do uh, to also be part of the middle class and support their children and look towards the day that they can also go on to higher education and whatever it is that they they uh, aspire to, to do. So I just think we have to be very careful when we start looking at this issue and thinking that it's an easy compromise. Uh, it's not. And I think that people who serve certainly on the military personnel subcommittee and, and on the armed services committee, I think they understand that. But we often do acknowledge amongst one another that we need to do a better job of educating um, our colleagues uh, who sometimes feel that it's, you know, it's just the Pentagon out there that's spending too much money. The reality is we're spending money on people and we need to be sure we take care of them. Thank you.
Um, I'm going to make a couple of closing remarks, um, but I'm going to start first by acknowledging everybody who is not only listening to this, but has participated in it. But like most change, it can't happen unless there are a team of people working in cooperation and collaboration to move it forward. And what we started long ago, um, almost well, almost 10 years ago, when I first came to Amazon, this issue was brought to my attention and something I'd heard at a conference and pursued the person into the hall, embarrassingly, uh, who had asked this question. Um, and I thought to myself quite naively at the time, oh, this is so easy. It's an administrative fix. This is silly. This is just an, a particular glitch in the law. Um, that particular glitch being including the basic allowance for housing as income in determining whether or not members of the military are eligible for SNAP. And here we are, nine and a half years later, and we still haven't been able to resolve this because it isn't easy, because it requires, I think, what we've heard a lot about um, on this conversation is there's a shift in thinking that has to take place. There is a recognition and an acknowledgement that has to take place, that there is no fault in any of this. These are the circumstances that have been created by large systems and external pressures. No one was in a position necessarily to predict how large the impact of this pandemic would be on food insecurity. We knew that a pandemic could have a devastating impact on this country, but I don't believe anybody had teased out that the numbers would push us close to 80 million Americans who are now food insecure. That it would drive those numbers, as Jen indicated, to astronomical highs in the military too. Who would have known that this could happen? This isn't the fault of those people who are struggling. These are the people who are trying to protect our nation, who step up and volunteer and do things that most of us would not be willing to undertake. Then the least we can do is ensure that they can feed their families, that they do not have this anxiety on top of everything else, that the will has to be there to pass what is a straightforward response that took years to craft, it's true, but it, it meets the needs and concerns that have been raised in the past. So we too agree with the Congresswoman that the time is now to act, that we have compromised, we have worked hard to come up with something that is a realistic and holistic solution. And it is vital and necessary because without it, we will have failed our military just when we are relying on them the most. I wanna thank everybody for participating with us this morning and afternoon, depending on where you are. And I look forward to seeing the realization of this and moving on to working together on something else. <laughs> thank you all, um, take care, stay well. Thank you.